Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to The Artist Prepares. I am your host, Mr. J the Actor. My next guest coming to the stage is from our nation's capital. Oh yeah, we're talking about the Chocolate City, y'all. He's a writer, director, and actor who finds inspiration in the world around him. He's a filmmaker that tends to create stories that revolve around an ordinary person that has extraordinary events happen to them. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Kendrick Jordan. What's good with you, man? You know, it's just another day in the life. Hey, another day, just living it up. Living it up. Living it up, <laughs> living yeah. it up as soon as I can. As soon as I can. <laughs> Hey, this day and age, man, it, it, it's happy just to see another day, man, on the real, for real. Absolutely. You still out in Cali, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, in, I'm currently in Los Angeles right now. Um, sunny, sunny Los Angeles. It's a nice, <laughs> cold winter day of 60-something degrees. Oh, how, how do you manage, man? You got your coat? <laughs> you got your park? Yeah, man, you, know, got the, uh, you know, I got my tank tops, um, my, my cargo shorts, and my flops. <laughs> 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 that's what's good man i'm happy to have you here today man we're gonna have some fun man we're gonna get into some things and let people know just how dope you are man but you know we're both artists man and you know before artists can really get in their zone man we gotta warm up a little bit so yeah. I, I got a few little rapid fire questions for you man you know just to get it to get it sparked sure. all right man so you you from the area uh nature's capital yes sir Southeast. So what is the best wing spot for you? Everybody got their favorites. What's your best? Um, so ironically, I heard my favorite spot is no longer a good spot anymore. Like they've gone through management a few times. But when I lived in D.C., Hong Kong, Delight, the top mm. of the hill from Baloo, yes, sir. Of, uh, uh, Alabama MLK, I think. I think that's what it is. On uh, 6th Street. Uh, top of the hill from Baloo. I used to go there after school. I went to church over there too. So it was like after church on Sundays, after high school, just walk up the hill, get me my four wings, fry hard, fries on the side, salt, pepper, mumbo sauce on the fries only. That's and then definitely. I get a little mumbo sauce packing on the fries to dip my wings in. Yes, sir. And, like, that was that was my that was my go to. But yeah, everyone <laughs> told me they was like, yeah, Hong Kong delight ain't it ain't delightful no more. <laughs> <laughs> Said it ain't delightful. So I was like, man, because I, I haven't been there in probably about six, seven years. Mm. So that specific one. So like most of the time when I go to DC, it's like I'm on other people's time. So like people be like, oh, we ain't driving all the way over to South Korea. He about to go over there. <laughs> so it's like I saw going to um the Danny's is right beside Johnny Boys. Yep. And then like that just be, kind of became my spot because that's just the area I was in over there on Southern Avenue. And then it would be um, the Danny's just like, uh, I want to say Suitland Station. Is it Suitland Station? It might be Suitland Station. That Danny's right there. Um, same street to Iverson Mall on. Right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you talking about the, uh, the Circuit City used to be at. <laughs> <laughs> good times. Good time. <laughs> yeah. So, you know uh, where we from, man. We listen to a, a unique sound called Go Go. Uh, Absolutely. What's your favorite Go Go band, huh? Backyard. All day. Backyard. All, yeah. All <laughs> Easy. I was a man. You know, like that was that was my joint. And Big G, everybody trying to mimic the Big G voice, you know. Sir, Max, we've all been there, though. <laughs> uh, new Balance or Fold Pauses? You only can pick one. Which one you um, New Balance is like, I probably get my DC card taken, but I've never had a, a pair of pauses. Never mm. had a pair of phones. Oh, but you kept the New Balance though. You, you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like, Mom's was not paying the uh, the two fifty for the phone posits. So New Balance is like, okay, yeah, you run track. We can use these for track. I ain't never went for track practice like these. <laughs> <Regular joint. laughs> they, uh, they was bought for track, but yeah, they ain't never they ain't never see that uh, that track. <laughs> Facts, man. So you're a filmmaker, dog. So name a movie that you would remake if you had the opportunity to. Ooh, okay. That one I got to think a little bit on. Um, if I had an opportunity to remake a movie. You want to know what? I would remake 
um, the new Star Wars prequels. Really? Um, the sequel trilogy. Okay. So the new ones, uh, seven, eight, nine. I remake those. Change the entire story up. Switch it up. <laughs> um, what Funny because I was actually talking to someone about that um, the other day about what I would do mm -hmm. if I because like I, I've always liked the whole battle between like the light side and dark side of the force, good and evil. That I've always wanted to see more of our main character leaning towards the dark side. That would be interesting. Like, like they tease it with Luke. Um, you know, we know Anakin Skywalker turned into Dark Vader, so he actually turned. And in this newest one, they teased it with um, Ray and Kylo Ren that I would have liked to have seen Ray and Kylo Ren actually team up mm. and them have that internal struggle with the light and the dark side between the two of them. More than just their little romance thing <laughs> that they had for Skype calls right and stuff. like what are you doing i don't know what are you doing you hang up no you hang up like it was like i mean i was like i i like that part but it was just like oh this is like so high school like these were like they're young adults <laughs> cool man let's take you to tv man what is your favorite 90s sitcom there was a lot of them too um, that's a very easy question for me. Like, I'm not a big fan of like the '90s sitcoms at all. So, Fresh Prince. Oh yeah, good. And I, and I got a reason behind it. And I always tell people like, um, you know, when it came to like Martin Living Single, uh, A Different World, all those shows. Like, I was I was in um, elementary school. I couldn't relate to that stuff. Like, everyone's always like, "You ain't like Martin." I was like, I didn't understand Martin's problems. Like. <laughs> yeah, like I just didn't get it. Like he he worked at a radio station. Cool. Like, you know, th these are adult people problems, but with Fresh Prince, he was in high school. Right, right. So like, you know, like that was more closer to me because I was like, oh, like my brother and his friends, they be doing this kind of stuff. Right, makes so, sense. Like, yeah, so like that's the only 90s show. <laughs> I lost it when it was Fresh Prince. Like everything else, like whenever people be like, oh, like check this out. I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so speaking along that, is there a, a movie or even a TV show that everyone is on that you just can't get? Because now um, everybody is, is, is fast to say, hey, everybody need to watch this. And then they, you know, like the next day they're on something else. Nah, like I, I haven't, I haven't come across any like TV. Well, I'm trying to think about like what's still on right now. Cause like I took, it took me a while to get into power. It's like, that's and, then, and then I got into power and I fell in love with power. Like, right. and I'm like, I'm liking what they're doing with um, power book two. Yeah. yeah. I'm liking what they're doing with it. Cause like personally from power, I can't stand Tyreek, but I think that book two does a great job right. of not making Tyreek the worst person. Yes. Like he, like he still, cause you still know what he did. It's like, bro, you got your sister killed. You killed your dad. Like you, you did a lot of stupid stuff. Like you have no reason to be in a drug deal. Like you was a smart kid. You grew up in the penthouse. Like you had no reason to want to want to get in the game, but you got in the game. But it's like in book two, it's just like, yo, like who are these people? Like what's going on? So That's I like what they're going with that. Um, Snowfall is a show that I um I kind of want to start watching. I haven't watched it yet. But it looks interesting. Like I never knew about it because mm -hmm. I kept mixing up Snowfall with uh, the movie Snow on the Bluff. <laughs> but yeah. I, I was just like, everyone's watching this. Like what? And this I was like, they made a TV show out of that. But then it's like, oh okay. Like this is that looks like something I want to get into. I just haven't yet. Um, yeah, like it. Even with the Mandalorian, like at first I didn't like that show, but then like after like the third episode, I was hooked. Okay, um, I, my sisters has been talking about that forever. I need to, I need to check. They like you gotta. Watch. It's, it's, it's one of those like it's a show for Star Wars fans. Okay, like, like they do like a lot, but it's like it's what they should have done with Star Wars with the new ones. It's something different. Mm -hmm. You still get the same like lore, the same locations. You even get like some characters that you haven't seen in a while come back. Right, but it's in its own new direction. It's a western in a right. sense. And I've even seen people complain like, oh, there's no Star Wars music in it. And it's like, doesn't need to be. 
you, you know that is you know you know that it's Star Wars. Um, but yeah, I can't really think of anything. This because is Empire still on TV? No, I think they finally did the last. Okay, so I, that was what I said. I would have been the one I threw out there, but yeah, I don't, I don't watch After that. The first season, crazy. Grey's Anatomy. Great, I cannot get into Grey's Anatomy. That's that's the one. Seasons. <laughs> yeah, like I just. Yeah, I had an ex girlfriend. She used to watch it, and I'm just like, they just at a hospital. Like, I don't, I don't see the <laughs> interest of it. Like, <laughs> like, they save a patient. They don't save a patient. Like, is there anything going on, like politically, externally, outside of the hospital? Like, because I started watching Scandal, and I was like, oh, right, this is dope. Mm-hmm. So I was like, oh, like same person made Scandal, made Grey's Anatomy. I was like, maybe I like Grey's Anatomy, and it was just like a random episode. I'm just like, what is this? Like, they just in a hospital. <laughs> Okay, she went home after a long day at working at the hospital. Like I just it was good. <laughs> that was going on. <laughs> yeah, Grey's Anatomy is the one that like, and it's still going on. Like they still got new episodes dropping. So still going. Yeah. Um another okay, another one for you. What is your favorite or do you have a favorite movie scene? The favorite movie scene. I got a few. Um okay. Matter of fact, I'm gonna I'm try to name three. Okay, let's get it. Um, first one, I would say I really love the uh, highway scene in Matrix Reloaded. Okay. Um, with uh, Morpheus tells Trinity that to go to the highway, and she's like, "You said never go on the highway, and you just got the motorcycle weaving in and out of traffic. The agents taking over random drivers, all this chaos." And then Morpheus gets the samurai sword and he goes one-on-one with one of the agents and then Neo just comes randomly flying in. Um, that's one. Um, second, I would say uh, training day. King Kong ain't got nothing on me. Yeah. Like just that, like that scene is just, that's when Denzel became my favorite actor. Right. <laughs> like, was like everyone always talks about like Malcolm X, like blah, blah, blah. I'm like, nah, Denzel is Zoe. <laughs> Antoine Fuqua became my favorite director after uh, Training Day. Right. Denzel became my favorite actor after Training Day. Right. Like, I didn't really care for the Denzel movies beforehand, before that. I mean, I went back and watched some of them and, you know, got a better appreciation of them. But after Training Day, that's when I was like, I'm like 13, 14 years old when that came out. So I'm like, oh. He was this like, is- Officer Hoyt. <laughs> and then uh, um, the showdown in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Okay. Um, and it's such a long scene of them just staring back and forth, just eyes darting, that I always say, like, it's no way you can put a seven minute standoff staring in a movie today and it will be accepted. Right. But it's like for what that scene is worth mm-hmm. for the whole of the movie, because at that point, you know, you don't know that he's going to like he emptied the gun of the guy that was his friend and that he was really just there to shoot the other dude. Hmm. Cause like they had so much beef back and forth that you was really like, yo, like this is um three-way standoff. Like they, they about to, and it's just like, and it just, the tension is built and you just like watching it. And like, whenever I look at it on YouTube, I'm like, this scene is, is seven minutes hmm. of them just staring back and forth. And I'm just like, the score is just amazing. And it's just one of those like, like I say, there's no way that you can get away with that. Right. <laughs> I would say those are like some of my three favorite scenes that I could just throw off the top of my head. Right. With being a filmmaker, do you feel like there's a um, a certain movie that like all artists should see? Because usually people have a movie like, yo, if you're going to be an actor or whatever, you got to see this movie. Do you have films like that? Uh, I believe that it's, it's, um, it's more intimate than that. Yeah. I think it's for every single artist. Like every artist is different. Right. One of the things that I just strongly dislike in film school is that they have these things like, oh, if you're gonna be a filmmaker, you have to watch this. Right. And, and it's just one of those like, that might not be the film I wanna make. And then it's like, there's nothing about this scene that even motivates me. And then you like, then you try to tell people like, oh, if, if this scene doesn't move you, then you can't be a filmmaker. And it's like, that's, that's, that's terrible. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I I don't like classic Hollywood movies. Yeah. I don't like anything made before the 70s. Mm. Like movies before the 70s don't crack into my top list right. until recently because I had to I had to discover them on my own. 
So for me, the oldest film that I like truly enjoy is uh, Seven Samurai by Akira Kurosawa. Okay. And I just saw that movie for the first time. Two, three, no, um, when the pandemic first started. So back in like March, March right. is when I first saw that film. And I was just like, I can't believe I waited this long to watch it. Mm. No, no, no. I, no, that was um, the Westerns that I went back and watched. No, but The Seven Samurai, I just watched that movie uh, about two months ago. Oh, and and um, so in like, it was October-ish. And people have been trying to get me to watch it for the longest. And I was just like, it's black and white. It's subtitled. I'm good. <laughs> I'm sorry. Fifties, I'm good, but it was just so good. It was like such a good movie, and that's when I realized, like, oh, I don't like those those white people movies that they always try to force on us, like the Citizen Kane, the Casablanca, is Gone with the Wind, um, North by Northwest, like all those movies. I was just like, they okay? I was like, nothing in this movie inspired me. I was like, I didn't see a single scene that made me like, oh, I got, I got to shoot that. <laughs> And, and then like, and but I hear so many times like, oh, if you're a filmmaker, you have to look, you have to study Hitchcock, you have to study Orson Welles, right. you have to go back to the classic era before you had CGI and all this other stuff. But I was like, the way I see it was, the movie that made me want to make movies was The Matrix, mm-hmm. Star Wars, mm-hmm. Harry Potter. Mm-hmm. Those movies didn't exist in that time period. Right, right, right. So I was more of the visual spectacle. So it was just like all the the visual, the special effects is what made me say like, I want to immerse myself in these worlds. Like I believe that movies should be an escape. Yeah. Like, you should dive into these worlds of like extreme fantasy and stuff. Like, you know, you just fully immerse yourself there. It's like, oh man, I want to go to this planet. Yeah. Like, oh man, I wish I had that power. Oh, yeah. I wish I could do what they did. Yeah. Oh my God, they got away with that crime. Like, so it was like, you know, like uh, things like that is what inspired me. So that's why I say like, it's, so it's like, if you ask me like, oh, what movies do I think like inspired me? It's like, I can name those, but it's, it, but it's like, like I say, even through film school, it was one of those, like when we was like, oh, like name a movie that inspired you. I was known as the Matrix guy. Hmm. And you know, sometimes a teacher would chuckle and stuff, but then it was like, Kendrick knows what he wants to do. And he knows exactly what movies he like and what he want to make. Right, because I like I don't like dramas. I don't care for dramas. They bore the hell out of me. Right, I like action. I like adventure. <laughs> so it's like, so that's what I say. So it's, I think is you know with that question, it's just more. It's more intimate. It's more personal. It you gotta you gotta get down to you as an artist. Of like course. what kind of artist will you be? Because you know your artist within you. So it's like what touches you on the inside. Nice. Because it's like if you do that traditional route of like oh. We're gonna watch Citizen Kane, the greatest movie of all time that was made in 1939. Mm-hmm. And it's like, this is the inspirational movie. Like, this is what cinema is. And then you watch it, and it's like, if you watch that movie and you're not moved by it, then it's like, oh, maybe I'm not meant to be a filmmaker. But it's like, that movie was made 80 years ago, 70 <laughs> years ago. Right. <laughs> it's like, and, I, and like, the thing I used to always say was like, are you telling me like better movies have not come? Then, Since right. 1939, like I get that this was the first movie to use wide shots and long takes. All right. I get, you know, trailblazing for 1939, but it's <laughs> 2020 now. Like we have progressed with technology. Like it's okay to lower it on the pecking order. They can say like greatest movie of those decades right. if you want to do it that way, but like don't. Like I always hate when people have like that movie in their top ten films well, you- of all. People always have that perspective of like, you got to do this or see this. And I've had that. I remember when I was in grad school and one of my um, fight directors, he was talking to me about uh, action movies. If you love action movies, you're an actor, you got to watch. It was Kill Bill. I never get, never saw the movie. And I'm like, why does everybody like this movie? He's like, is this movie? He went home, got the DVD, gave it to me, wrapped it up. Like, you're going to love this. And I remember coming back like, this is the dumbest movie ever. Like, how do people like this? I thought it was the dumbest thing ever. I, I, I love Kill Bill. Right, but- Kill Bill's my favorite Tarantino movie. I was just yeah. like, oh, this is dumb. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. I didn't get it. And so I always ask yeah. other people like, though, do you have, like, I didn't get it. There's nothing I got from it was like, 
oh, that was a great, you know, action scene. I, 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 nothing I got from it. I just was like, this is dumb. Like, I want my hours and chains back. Like, it, 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 was, say, it got, to, got to touch you personally. Right. So, and it's like, and, and it is also one of those things too. Where, um, so the thing that I like about Kill Bill is, and this is, you see it in a lot of my writing. And I try to like put it in, I want, this is what I want to be like my voice. Mm-hmm. It, I love rebellion. Mm-hmm. I love a revenge story. Yeah. I love betrayal. All good. And then I also love like an unexpected death. So one, so like I try to have three of those four things in like almost every project that I do. Mm-hmm. It's some kind of rebellion, some kind of revenge, some kind of betrayal, and some kind of unexpected death. Yeah. Now I haven't really been like necessarily able to do like the unexpected death part, mm-hmm. but like in all my like projects I've had so far, there's it's all of them are like rebellion stories. Yeah. Someone's rebelling against something. So it's like with Kill Bill, you had her like rebelling against Bill. Mm-hmm. And then the whole revenge of Bill killed my killed my husband, killed my kid, tried to kill me, didn't work. So I'm eliminating everyone. All right. Those are like, like I say, like those are things that I enjoy. Mm-hmm. So it's like, and that's why I say it's like, when I do go back and teach, I want to be like, you know, that intimate thing. Cause like, just cause you like action movies, you might like Pearl Harbor not kill bill all right they're both action movies but they're both two different extreme spectrums right right kill bill is extremely gory yeah like you know it's unnecessarily gory and it does take a lot of like the whole wushu films and then like also like a little bit of the western yeah you don't like any of that (laughs) you're gonna be like what the fuck is this like why is it blood just squirting everywhere (laughs) and then i you know you might like the war like war action movie. So it's like Pearl Harbor. Like there's no blood, there's no dismemberance in Pearl Harbor, but it's it's a big action film. There's lots of explosions. All right. And then it's like, oh, maybe you like uh, you know, the action film along the lines of the Marvel movies. Mm-hmm. Marvel movies, you might see a little speckle of blood on Captain America's face, but like you don't get like no blood splurting out the mouth. No, like no one lost an arm with blood just dripping out. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like it's different, different avenues of it. Yeah, and that's why, you know, and then that, that's what I say. That was a great example of like, you know, and I feel like that's a teacher failing you. Yeah, like like a teacher failing in a moment to teach because it's like, oh, you like action movies? You'll love Kill Bill. I would never say that. <laughs> say that. I love Kill Bill, but I don't love Kill Bill because it's an action movie. I love Kill Bill because it's a gory revenge story. Right. And it's like, and it has a woman assassin. That's, and that's another thing that I like is I like having like unexpected non traditional characters in these roles that you don't think they could do, but they execute it. Exactly. Um, another example of a movie I don't like that's like that is uh, Divergent. Mm-hmm. So, with the Divergent series, this girl, she's like a grown up as a farmer, but she wants to be this thing called Dauntless, which are like the warrior class. Yeah. First movie, she has no business being a warrior because she's been a farmer all her life. Mm. So it's like, it makes sense that she sucks as a warrior. But in my movie three, I'm like, I need her to get some hand to hand combat skills. <laughs> like, I need it to look a little bit more fluid. Right. And that's what kills that entire movie series for me is like, I'm like, I just don't believe her as a person who's been with this people for this amount of time now. <laughs> and she still fights like a girl. Right. I'm, so it's just like so so that's what I mean, like in the sense of like, yeah, it was cool with her doing that in the first movie because it was unexpected, but I was like, by movie three, it's like I need them skills to to get better. Yeah. A good example of you know, when they do it better is Hunger Games. Yeah. Like she wasn't a fighter, she could just hunt. But then she was like forced to be a fighter that by movie three, she's more believable as a warrior and a soldier than the girl was in the divergent series. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. So tell us that, um, you know, you're a filmmaker. Do you have uh, people as far as like filmmakers or even directors that you feel like have had an influence on you? Or have you seen their work and be like, yo, I love their work. I want to do whatever. Yeah. Um, Antoine Fuqua. Okay. Uh, Training Day, Olympus Has Fallen, The Equalizer. And then even he did, you know, he did Magnificent Seven, which is a remake of the Western Magnificent Seven, which was a rip off of Akira's, Akira Kurosawa's uh, Seven Samurai. Mm. So my introduction to that was Magnificent Seven and the remake with Denzel and Chris Pratt that Antoine Fuqua directed. 
Yeah. And I was like, yo, this is kind of cool. It's different. So that's what I say. Antoine Fuqua, he's up there. Um, second guy is Michael Bay. Um, so Michael Bay, for me, it was Bad Boys. Sir. Like the Bad Boys franchise. And it's funny because, like, they always rate Bad Boys as, like, a terrible movie. If you ever look at the critic scores up, yeah. it's really low. But, like, I love Bad Boys. Um, the first few Transformers movies that Michael Bay did, I really enjoyed. Um, and then I would also say Zack Snyder mm-hmm. would be my number three guy. Um, 300, Dawn of the Dead, uh, Man of Steel. I really enjoy Batman versus Superman. Um, the movie of his that I really like the most is probably like his, easily probably his worst movie. It's a movie called Sucker Punch. Mm-hmm. Um, it was about a girl who witnessed her stepfather kill her mother. But in order for the stepfather to keep the money, he had her committed to an insane asylum and he paid off the director of the insane asylum to be like, hey, I got all this money coming through. We need her to get a lobotomy so she can't talk about it. Mm. And so then what they do is they, the girls there pretty much, they have a mission to get these three items so she can escape. (laughs) But instead of them just getting the items, they turn it all into missions. Oh. So what happens is she does this dance. You never see the dance. She's a white girl, so you gotta use your imagination. Right. It just starts off as a sway, and her dance skills are like supposedly so good that it like completely immerses the person watching into like to be like in a trance. Right. So it's like, and then like for them to go get the item that's in the insane asylum, they're all like now these super soldiers who had katanas, machine guns, and is like, I think the first one's like, has like a World War II backdrop. Another one, they have to defeat a dragon in a castle, but they're all just in this insane asylum and all of these things just happen while she's doing a dance. So it was like, it was one of those things where it's like, it just immerses you in the world. Wow. So a lot of people are like, this is just stupid as shit. But I was like, yo, this is creative as shit. Right, right, right. Yeah, and so, and then funny story, Michael Bay and Zack Snyder, actually went to the school that I just got my master's from. And they were big reasons of why I chose to go to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. Yeah. It was because both of them went there. So when I was doing my whole like search for film schools, I was like, okay, let me go to schools with directors that I actually like went to. Right, right. Because then I was like, I won't be forced into that whole like teledrama. <laughs> like, I th- Put two put two sixty year old people in a room and tell an interesting story, and it's like I'm I'm thirty. Like, <laughs> what what interesting story can I tell between two like a sixty and a seventy year old? So, that's weird. And, it, and that's why I like this because, like I say, because um, you know, I don't know if you're gonna have the video, but like this backdrop is from the last film that I shot at school. Like, I shot a VFX superhero film, and you know, they're flying through the air. And, you know, he's just choking the guy as they going through the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And, you know, like, and, and it was it was one of those things where they was, you know, my teacher was like, you, you this what you want to do? And I'm like, let's do it. Why and not? It was just, yeah. And it was one of those things where, um, you know, I was able to talk to a whole bunch of different people. Like, you know, I w- it wasn't just a, me and the thesis production teacher. This was me, the thesis production teacher me and the soundstage guy, me and one of the cinematography teachers. Like I was constantly talking to different departments and things right. like that. And then when I talked to the chairman of the school, he was like, oh yeah, that's what producers do. You're, you're a movie producer. And I was like, it took me a while to accept it, but it was like, okay, I'm a movie producer. Right, that's and, dope. Um, yeah, cause like I also had like, you know, I went to an entire different department at the school to get, um, one guy, he drew up concept art for me. That's gonna be the world that they're in because I shot in front of a green screen. And then, so I went to that department eventually get them to just do the uh, background. Right, right. And then they uh, was like, well, you should do a concept art first. Did a concept art, send the concept art back over to them. So they was like, after Christmas break, they're gonna uh, send out the email blast. Mm-hmm. So then someone can do a matte painting for me for what the background would be. And then like, I get the matte painting back and he's also telling me like some of their students can do VFX. So I might even get a VFX artist out of this as well. So, damn. Oh, the- yeah. 
but it's just one of those things where like a lot of people won't don't go over to other departments to like you know the mix and mingle and stuff but it was you know I knew what I wanted to do I knew that I didn't know what I was doing and that's one of the reasons why like I'm pro film school because this thing could have easily have been a disaster right right but it's one of those like I feel like film school is the place to fail Mm. When it comes to projects, I went on a whole tangent. Like we were talking about, right, you get, hey, about this. yeah. This is your show today. I'm just an audience member, dog. It's all good. I just got yeah. one last rapid fire question for you, dog. Uh, uh, we we as artists always have advice that people try to give us, whether it's warranted or not, uh, mm-hmm. or whatever, as it relates to our craft. Has there been any advice that you've received that has really helped you with your career? Oh yes. Um, and it's funny, because like I say, the teacher that I have for this one, he gave me the best advice I've ever heard, but it was by accident. He didn't mean to. Um, and it's advanced to art form. Okay. So every project that you do should be advancing the art form. Mm-hmm. So it's like, if you are going to do something that's like really crazy, yeah. make sure it pushes the art form forward and not take it back. Yeah. And I took that and ran with it. And he was like, I said that. I was like, yeah, you said it like twice in class. And he was like, oh. Yeah. And he was like, and you really, I was like, yeah, I gravitated onto it. I was like, advanced art form. I was like, you're absolutely right. Because that's the whole reason I, I even wanted to make films was because I want to see people of color in these movies. Yeah. Like I want to see like black people as leads in Star Wars, as leads in like a Harry Potter series, as a lead in like The Matrix, something like that. And I always tell people like, I don't want to make black versions of those movies. Like, I'm not trying to, like, niggerfy, like, you know, like, these sci-fi action movies where it's, like, it's Star Wars in the hood and, like, you pulling up in an X-Wing at, like, a chicken joint. And it's, like, why? Like, you know, like, why why are we doing that? Right. And people are like, oh, that's more relatable. And it's like, no, it's not. Make I, was like, I was like, you have Black Star Wars fans. You have Black Matrix fans. You have Black Harry Potter fans. Like, we exist. So it's like, you know, we can make that same movie just with a black person to lead. Like, I don't need like a hundred percent black cast. It's just right. like, I just want to see us in more prominent roles in this kind of media. And that's going to be me advancing the art form forward. That's dope. And, um, another uh, good piece of advice I got, and it was funny because this was actually from um, Morgan Cooper, the guy who did the uh, Bel Air trailer that oh. went super viral. Yeah. yeah, I met him at a film festival. He's actually the reason I shot this. And he was like, because I asked him a question of like, you know, when when do you elevate your art? Like, when do you know it's time to elevate it? And it's funny because it's one of those questions is worded weirdly, but you have to, like the question had to affect you for you to like truly understand it. Like, when do you elevate your art? Because everyone's like, oh, just always elevate it. He was like, I get it. He's like, it's a weird question, but I get it. I know exactly what you're talking about. And he was like, to be honest, you just got to trust yourself and you just got to just do it. He was like, because at the end of the day, you just point a camera at people. Mm. At the end of the day, that's all you're doing is you point a camera at people and you push and record. What whatever you record, that's up to you. Wow. But like when it comes to like pushing past your boundaries, yeah. just remember at the end of the day, you just point a camera at people and push and record. So if it don't work out, it just don't work out. Right. But you learn something from it. Mm. It just didn't work out. Cause you just, he's like, he's like, it's no life or death. Like no one's dying. Like no one's life is on the line because you decided to shoot something different. You just push and record. If it don't work out, cool. Oh, you, you, you can do another project tomorrow. And I was just like, yo, and he was like, and he's like, but I get the question. And he was like, it's a question that asked enough. And he was like, you just gotta, he was like, but he's like, but you gotta know what you can do. So it's like you gotta you, you gotta be real with yourself. Right. You gotta know what you can do. And then I kind of took that a little bit further with myself, which was like, you know, know your budget. Okay. Know your crew, know your cast, know what you can accomplish. Right. So it's like you can think of everything in the world, but you know, I don't have I don't have like a million dollars to throw at VFX. Right. So it's like so it's like when I shot this, there's no actual hand-to-hand combat in it. Okay. Like so, I made it at a point where it's like uh, they just like so strong that like they just throwing blows like um, anime style. Okay. And it's like you six feet, eight feet apart, 
but I'm so strong that I throw a punch, you feel it in your chest. Yeah. So that's just what I did because like I had money for a stunt coordinator. <laughs> How can we do this without it being a stunt? Mm. I didn't have any money for any rigging. So it's like, how can I shoot these people without having them suspended in the air? So this is actually just a rotated image that like, um, like they're just standing up vertically. And I was like, okay, for this, you're flying through the air. And I was like, the earth is behind the guy in the red, mm. in the red hood. All right. And like, and then like space is behind the white guy. All right. And then I had like a leaf blower blowing it in between them. To like kind of give you that simulation that they're going through the air. Right. And I was like, yeah, because I was like, I'm just gonna have to rotate this image. Dang. And then, you know, but it was just one of those things where it's like, you know, I had to know what I can accomplish. I knew what I wanted, but it's like, how can I accomplish this? Yeah. And then one of the other things too was it's like you don't see anybody's feet in this because I didn't have the capability of showing feet. Mm-hmm. So when I went to like the VFX people, they straight up told me they was like, Yeah, we can't do shadows. Like that's gonna be like too much for mm-hmm. them to try to have shadows in a moving picture. So yeah. if you can shoot it without showing their feet, that'd be perfect. It worked out because our green screen, we just used a duvetine. So it's just like gray back, like gray ground because we're in the, on the sound stage. Right. So it's not like standing in like in a completely wrapped green like space. Right. right. Um, and that's what I'm saying. It's like. I learned so much from this project. And then this is my advice that I always give out to people is that um, every single project that you shoot, every even as an actor, like every every project that you're in, right. you should learn something. Yes. And if you don't learn anything, either that project failed you or you didn't push yourself. So it's like, as a director, it's like, I, I don't want to direct things that I know I can do. Because I believe like that's how you get a stagnant career where it's just you just make shit and it's just like, okay, you know, he made a movie. He's okay. But then it's like, you know, if you push it, like look at Christopher Nolan. Like, you know, um every project that he does is like, it's just one of those like they approved this. And it's, you know, and it's just one of those like um like I haven't seen Tenant yet, but I've heard like mixed views on Tenant. But it's just like, look at what he did with Batman. He made Batman into a grounded reality series All right. that still was like pushing the boundaries of like what superhero films could be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then like uh, the prestige, it was like, what is this? Inception, Interstellar. It's just like, it's just these movies where it's like, no one else is doing this thing. So it's like, you know. <laughs> But then also at the same time, is like he has the budget. His movies are expensive as hell because you got to pay people. <laughs> like, like it's, and, you know, it's a team effort. So it's like, that's the other thing that I always want to tell people. Because this is the reason I left North Carolina was because when I was there, I didn't hear enough of like the team effort part of it. People tell me like, oh, if you're going to direct, you have to know how to do everything. Mm. And that's, that's, that's the, I want to say like, that's the first mistake that people tell young directors is like oh if you want to direct you got to know everything you don't have to know everything you have to know how to communicate everything Mm -hmm. like as a director communication is key if you cannot communicate your idea you're not going to be a good director because i suck at camera like the whole like everyone's like oh you went through grad school and film and like you, you you can't be a cinematographer like not at all like i would never accept a cinematography job Cause even at school, people was like, "How are you a grad student and you don't know that lenses have focal marks?" I was like, "I didn't know what those numbers on the lens meant." <laughs> like, like it's like I, I knew how to like focus it, but like I didn't know that like, oh, this is like if you put the focal mark at six, everything within six feet of the lens will be in focus. I was like, I didn't know that. That's what that number meant. I just thought those were just, you know, numbers for something else. <laughs> um, you know, like I know about like bouncing light now and like diffusing light and how to use like solids and flags and creating like uh like boxing in light and killing some of the spills. So that way it's like, if you want to like, if me and you are in the room and I just want you to be lit. All right. And me to be like in a really warm kind of like softer light, but you to be in like a really hard light. 
I could, I know how to like the process of doing it. It's probably taking me way longer than it should to do it. Right. But it's like, I understand the process of doing it to the point where I can communicate that. Right, to right. My center. And, um, and like the, one of the questions I'm always getting asked is like, oh, what camera do you like shooting with the most? And I'm like, it's whatever my cinematographer want to shoot with. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> Like, I'm not that guy that's like, oh, all my projects have to be shot with a, a red dragon. Like, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, like, this, like this one, the project behind me was shot with uh, a red. This uh, project, like, it's funny, my editor, he actually just sent me the final cut earlier today, and I just got to add music to it and do some ADR, and then that'll be done. Um, that one was shot with the uh, Alexa Mini. Mm -hmm. um, the fashion commercial that I did was shot with the Alexa Mini. Um, I've done, let me see. Well, I guess the majority of my project shot was just Alexa Mini, just because that's just been the camera that's been available. But yeah, but like I'm not I'm not stuck on like the equipment phase of it. So like I say, so going back to like what people said to me in North Carolina, it was like, oh, you gotta know how to do everything. And it's like, no, you have a team. So it's like I latched on with cinematographers in my school because they were like, yo, you always coming up with some crazy shit to shoot. Yeah. Like, just point me in the direction because like people like working with me because it was like, I'm going to let you be a cinematographer. So I'd be like, Hey, I want like this kind of a mood in this room. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. Here's my lighting layout. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to get all of these lights. Can you do this? If we don't have this light, Oh, mm -hmm. uh, let me rearrange some things. How many lights do you think we can get? I was like, uh... and also since I worked in an equipment room, it'd be like, I knew like what was there and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was like, worst case scenario, like we use the sound stage, we have like up to like seven one Ks to use, and then we still got like the nine Ks and six Ks. So we got like different types of lights we can use for different kind of stuff. Oh, okay. But I was like, but if we don't do it on the sound stage, then we won't have that much power. We won't have that big one K. We'll have like the mini mode one Ks and blah blah blah. And they'd be like, oh, okay, you know, that back and forth. So it's like, okay we can't use this, cool. Then I have to rearrange the lighting scheme with what we can use. Right, so that team, that collaborative effort was really- mm -hmm. And it's just, and it's like I said, just a back and forth. Right. And that's just between me and camera. And then like what I've learned too is that the cinematographer is the person that's in charge of production. Mm -hmm. So the cinematographer is the one that's over the grips and the electric. It's not a director out there barking orders. Right, right. And it's like a chain of command that I really appreciate film school for because I would have never learned it on set because you always got so many people Nobody. yapping. Right, right. Because cause, cause when, cause when you get it where it's like, oh, if you're a director, you got to know how to do everything. Most of the time when you meet other people to shoot with, they're also directors who do everything. So everyone's a director who do everything. So everyone's want to chime in. Right. And it's like, nah. Like, I, don't, like, I don't mind working with a cinematographer who wants to be a director. But for my production, you're a cinematographer. Yeah. Like, I don't need my uh, one of the grip guys giving me direction advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, everyone has a role to play. Play your so, position. <laughs> well, let's. Like, I mean, like, don't get me wrong, like, suggestions, and if you notice things, that's great. But it's like, I'm the director where I want to work with my actors. Yeah, yeah. So, it's like, I like my cinematographer to know production. So, it's like, I can be like, hey, um, they're a little bit dark. Okay, they go tell their people. All right, they're a little bit dark. Let's uh, get like a different diffusion, blah, blah, blah. They do their thing. And I'm just talking to the actor like, hey, all right. So for this performance, blah, so while they doing that with the production team, I'm just talking with the actors. Right, right, right. That's dope. That's dope, man. So let, let's take it, let's take and it I back. And I never touch camera. <laughs> Dang, that's dope. Let's take it back a little bit about you. You talked about your film thing, but I, you know, I'm on my little research, you know, so I found a little, uh, I guess this is a quote, uh, something, this about you, just something you said. So, you know, you can verify if this is true or not. Uh, it says, my man Kendrick Jordan, born, of course, nation's capital, Washington, D.C., during the time it was called the Chocolate City. Shout out to everybody who really know what the Chocolate City is. The murder capital. You say, I found peace in stories that took me away from the problems at hand. Originally growing up, going to school for journalism, I became too good at making up stories or spicing them up instead of writing just on the facts. My creative career began as I shifted into screenwriting and left journalism behind. I find my inspiration in the world around me and often daydream to create a string of 
what if events are from the simplest actions? I tend to create stories that revolve around an ordinary person that has extraordinary events happen to them. I am also inspired heavily by anime, film sagas with the big continuous stories and stories with the fantasy element. Tell us about that statement, my brother. Oh, wow. I did say that. That's, that's very factual. I, I remember when I wrote it, but I, I don't even remember what I wrote that on. Like I changed it completely, but yeah, like I literally, like, I think I just changed that like a month ago, but um, so yeah, just like with the, uh, the first part was, you know, I grew up in Southeast DC. Um, a lot of my childhood friends were murdered and stuff. So I don't really have so many like childhood friends that like, I can just go back to DC and be like, Hey, remember when we was like seven. Cause it's just, you know, I just either grew apart or, you know, that lifestyle just wasn't really suited for me. And it was just, um, yeah. And that's, that's when I first got into Star Wars. Mm. Like, um, and it's funny too. It's so funny. Cause like, I really wonder like what my life would be if my film career started then. Mm. Cause my dad used to always say, like when I would be watching Star Wars, he'd be like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if like a little black kid from the farm saved the universe from the Galactic Empire? I didn't understand representation. I was just like, but it's Luke Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like I never, you know, really realized that he was putting that in my head. And then like, you know, when I played my toys, my action figures and stuff. Like I would create these massive worlds where my our entire house was a planet mm -hmm. so my room would be one city or country or whatever and then my mom's room would be like another country and then like the basement would be like the evil people lair so i would have like toys just randomly throughout the house and i would hate when my mom would like find my toys and like put them back in my room because i'm like no like that's what trapped in this world like everyone has to go save them so they got to stay there <laughs> but um but yeah but like that's how like my creativity kind of started but like it was never dwelled on and then um I went to McKinley Tech in the 10th grade 10th 11th grade and that's when I started journalism stuff and like just video production so I always knew I wanted to be on tv mm -hmm. but I didn't know that like you know regular people could be filmmakers I felt like the only way I could be on tv was through the news because that's just what I saw. And it would just be like, you know, news people come to our schools all the time and talk to us. So I was like, oh, okay, these are real people. Right. Like to be in Hollywood, you gotta be born into it. Right. So, or, or you gotta be a rapper. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> and, um, you know, I went to uh, North Carolina Central University in journalism. Um, and it's funny, cause this is the part of the story that often isn't told. But um, what made me switch to the theater department well, what made me become a theater minor was I actually got in trouble at Central. I got put on disciplinary probation. Um, I was actually suspended for a semester and I was like temporarily suspended during finals week, mm. uh, my junior year. And none of my teachers believed me that, well, I ain't gonna say none of them, like two to three of my teachers just did not believe that I was suspended. So they failed me. So I had, in order to graduate, I still had like one, like three credit hours of journalism that I needed. And I was like, well, I'm not going to come back the following year for just three hours. <laughs> and I was like, I already was taking enough classes that like me taking like an additional class would have put me at like 22 hours. Mm -hmm. So the next thing was um, I had a teacher, Dr. Mack, um, love Dr. Mack in the mass con department. I believe she's still at Central. Um, I talked to her all the time too. And I always let her know the story. She actually pulled me to the side. She's the only teacher century to do this. And was like, journalism isn't for you. And I was like, yeah, you know, everyone keeps saying that. And she was like, you are really, we gotta find out what's for you. Mm -hmm. Like she was like, you're a good writer, but you make up your news stories. And she was like, you already told me like in the newspaper class, you made up every story that they couldn't publish anything. And I was like, well, yeah. Cause I, you know, I partied a lot. So I would be like, oh, it's an event of the being Duke. Cool. Oh, shit, I got a homework assignment. Oh, let me spice this up. It was a brawl in the back between the two, like, modeling troops. Okay, let me make up these people that I'm going to interview. Because I'll be there, you know, with the Wild Boys band or whatever. So we just drinking, you know, doing whatever we're supposed to be doing. And then so it's like, you know, I'm on stage performing, coming up with, like, what I'm about to write in this news story. <laughs> Making up people. They was like, you actually had sources and stuff. Like, I didn't know I was creating characters. Right, right. I just, to me, I was just doing a homework assignment. Um, so then Dr. Mack, I had a class called Writing for Radio and Television, and it was just like these brainstorming classes. And then like halfway through the semester, she was like, this is what you do. And I was like, what? She was like, create a write. 
I was like, oh, this is a real career? She was like, yes. She's like, but unfortunately, this is the only creative writing class at Central Office. Wow. And I was like, damn. And she was like, so what we're going to do is, she's like, I don't want to, you know, because I know you so close to graduation. You already completed most of the uh, mass comm. I'm going to send you down to the theater department. I'm going to send you to Dr. Shabi. And they got like a playwriting class and an acting class because I know you want to be on TV. So take both of those. So then I was like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Meet Dr. Shabi. She was like, yo, you got a raw talent. And, you know, Dr. Shabi was real because Dr. Shabi was like, I don't like it, but you got a raw talent. <laughs> 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 but and like I love Ashabi. Like Ashabi's my homie. Like, you know, is it like Ashabi gives that tough love. Like a lot of people, they always be like, oh, but Dr. Ashabi, like it's so like, you know, she's mean, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, nah, it was just tough love. Like, no one's gonna hold your hand outside of school. All right. So it's like you gotta learn how to take that criticism and make it a criticism you never gonna hear again. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's my other thing. Like my other life motto, if you don't like criticism take it to the point where no one will ever give you that criticism again. Because you're always going to get criticized. But if there's a certain one that you don't like, fix it. That's all it is. You just got to fix it. So then, um, you know, but took the playwriting class. The first play I wrote was called Bliss. It was a contemporary piece about um, college sweethearts. That's the but, one to the uh, National Black Theater Festival, right? Did it read yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was the one with, uh, the, yeah, contemporary. It was like the student's choice. My readers explained my play better than I could. Like, I remember like all of the teachers, uh, they all, everyone hated it. Everyone that was older, everyone over 40 hated it. Cause they were like, they don't get it. It was like, well, who's the girl he should end up with? Shouldn't he fall in love with the best friend? It was like, nah, you know, like we have best friends. It's the opposite sex nowadays. Right. Like, women cheat too <laughs> like it's not just always the man that cheats it's like there's not always this happy ending and then it was like why did he have sex with her one more time it was like why wouldn't he <laughs> you hit that joint one more time for the road and you just you know you just done with it and i remember dr austin um you know rest his soul i really wish that you know i could have stayed closer in touch with him he gave me like my first bit of advice he was like hey we are old you got your target audience up there. As long as you got an audience, you can write whatever you want. Mm. And everybody just shut up after that. And that's when I was like, who is this guy? Like, cause I didn't know Dr. Austin yet. Right, right, cause right. like, before, like I officially declared theater as a minor. Right, right. And I was just like, you know, just this, you know, you know how Dr. Austin is, he's like the calm, Dr. Austin could be a ninja. Cause of how, just how smooth he is. Yeah. And he just stood up. Everyone just kind of got quiet. He said it everyone just shut up and I was just like man like who like I, I was just like in awe like who is this guy and that's what he said he was like you got a target audience your target audience is up there it's not none of us down here you write for your audience mm. and he was like you clearly got one wow, it's not now. wow. and yeah and then like I became a theater minor after that that's when I, you know I started acting in more plays uh took a few classes and then I knew the goal was always the goal for me was never the stage. Like oh. I was never a big fan of the stage, but um, just to kind of cut back into like the bio was, I wasn't a big fan of the plays that we put on at oh. Central because HBCU, um, we had like a recurring theme of the black upliftment and the black struggle. Right, right. That we didn't really have too many contemporary pieces. Like it's nothing, I, I don't think it's anything wrong with like, you know, like August Wilson or, you know, Raisin in the Sun, Color Purple, uh, Serafina, like those things. But it was just, I wanted just more contemporary, like American stuff. Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, things that just didn't deal with the oppression of being black. <laughs> so, so um, but like I said, but like I always knew that I wanted to do film. But from my experience at Central, it, I don't remember who it was, but someone was just like, well, you're a writer, why don't you just write your own stuff? And then I was like, oh, I guess I am a writer. Cause I didn't, I still didn't consider myself a, a writer yet. Right. I just knew I wanted to be an actor. Right. And then I was like, okay. And then I started writing more and then it became like, well, you're in North Carolina, like no one's gonna direct it for you. You gotta direct it yourself. And it was like, okay. And then um, I transferred, well, I not transferred. I uh, took some classes at UNCW cause they was like the Hollywood of the South. 
I strongly do not recommend that school's film program at all. If anyone's listening and they're like thinking about it, um, that's the place where I met the teachers to tell me like, I don't understand the process of being a filmmaker. Someone told me I would never get into a master's program. Um, another teacher told me that's when I also first heard like, oh, if you're going to be a director, you have to know everything. Like, why is your cinematographer telling you what shots mm. to do? You tell your cinematographer what shots to do. They just push record. And I was like, well, why do they have a whole Oscar category if that's all they do? Like, I feel like they should do more than just push record. Um, you know, like, so yeah, like, you know, experiences happen. And then like, that's when I kind of became more clear and focused on like exactly what it was I wanted to do. Right. Then I relocated to LA. And then even when I first got out here, it was just like, I'm here. And it was like, okay, maybe I could do the acting thing. And it's just like, show some interest in, um, directing but so so I, back though for us when you were at central once you started uh minor in theater did you did you start that's when you got started serious with doing plays first before you did the writing no so i never wanted to do plays okay you just, just like central that's just all that that was the closest thing that i could get to what i'm at now that was at central right 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 okay. so it was like um because i even with stage acting like i don't think that i'm a strong stage actor I think I'm a much stronger actor on the screen because I I don't I can't do that whole like the projecting thing and then like just to being big like I got charisma to the point where like my body language can show but it's just like vocally I couldn't I couldn't just really like right yeah. <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> like even like now it's like you know I just I just talk like I got like part of my charm is just like my monotone low voice that I have and it's just like on the stage it just it didn't work out. And then it's like, for me to project, it just damn near sounded like I was yelling. Hmm. So when you- So it's like- hmm? My bad, go ahead, go ahead. I'll let you finish. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So like, for me, like acting is like, you know, like, I'm, I'm just like a more intimate actor. Yeah. Like sitting in a chair with like a drink and like a cigar or something, just talking to someone. Right. Like, I don't know what it is that like they need. Like, I'm just talking directly into them. But it's like, I can do it low and like calm and without all the emotions and energy playing everywhere. And I could just show those emotion in just my eyes. But on the stage, you can't see the eyes. Right. So it's like, you know, you can't show the emotion in the eyes on the stage. No one can see that shit. <laughs> <laughs> so even we talk about Central, was, was being at Central the first time that you kind of recognized yourself or realized that you were an artist there? Because I know you went to, you know, you went to Cali, started making films and things like that. But at what? Well, yeah, I was at, um, at Central is when I realized it. You are like that the moment when, like I said, when my teacher, Dr. Mac, you know, sat me down, was like, we got to figure out what it is you want to do. All right. Because she was like, you know, journalism, you, we both have to come to the conclusion that journalism just wasn't for me. She was like, we had to figure out something. Because it's just one of those, like, don't just keep giving the school your money and taking out student loans just to say you got a degree. Like, there's still life after school. And that's when I, that's what I said, like, that journey from journalism to theater into film like I needed that journey like without those conversations like I always say if I didn't spend it I probably wouldn't be in LA right now it would help you it, it was good for you <laughs> yeah, so like if I didn't get you know in trouble with the uh with the school to get suspended like those those course of events would have never have like lit off that light bulb like I'll probably still be in North Carolina like trying to work at someone's news station and probably would have been like a middle school teacher by now or a manager at the hotel or restaurant I was working at. Just right. I'd just be a miserable person. Like right. I wouldn't be happy. Right. Cause I would have never have known that this avenue existed. Right. So uh I, we didn't get to talk about it, but uh, I'll let you tell it. How do you and I know each other, man? Um we met on the cast of the misanthrope. Yeah, the misanthrope you play uh was it a Alsef? Yeah, you was Alsef, and I think I was a Gaste. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and like, we we hit it off because like, <laughs> my characterization, I made my person like this real flamboyant. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> this super flamboyant person. Like, I I had like a wig from like Halloween that I wore, put it into a ponytail. I was talking like this the entire time and just doing things on my shoulder. And it was just like, what the fuck is this guy doing? But it was like, I remember I think Kamora was the director and she just loved it. She was just like, 
that's is different because it's supposed to be a comedy. So she was just like, keep doing that. And I was like, okay, I'm with it. And it was just, you know, hey, yeah. And then like, yeah, I say like, you know, we hit it off then. And then, um, and it's funny because I actually think that you replaced me on um, For Color Girls, For Black Boys. Yes. I think that you, because uh, I couldn't make it. Yeah. And I think that, yeah. yeah. You was the, uh, I don't remember what number it was, but I think like, yeah. Oh. Number eight, I think I was, or number nine, eight or nine, I think I was, something one of those. But yeah, that was a crazy experience too. Uh, and the business door was crazy because I got like noticed like two weeks before the show. Hey, you want to be in this show? Uh, yeah. Oh, here's the script. Forty five pages later, like whoa. Oh, okay. All right, let's just make it work. But uh, and I, it's funny because I don't know if you remember it, but I remember in the middle of this, it was either the maybe it was a dress rehearsal. But it was the ladder that you climbed up to look over the uh, the wall. Yeah. And I didn't know that that ladder was a part of the set. And I was like, yo, why is it a ladder right here? <laughs> and I remember I was on and he was like, yo, man, move, move. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, that's how you get up. <laughs> <laughs> like, I almost ruined the whole scene. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were looking like, no, what is this? Why is this here? Yeah, like I'm like, yo, why is this random ladder right here? Like, I don't like, is this, is this safe? <laughs> hey, that, that show was fun. It's funny because Deja was in there and, you know, I also interviewed Deja as well, as well as Chase, you know, they were all in that show. So to see all of us in there and, you know, me coming back, of course, you know, I had graduated already. I was honored to come back to, you know, get another opportunity to be on that stage. So it was a fun experience for me. But so let, let's transition. So you talked about, um, you talked about Central, you talked about going to UNC Wilmington, which I had it in my notes. I was going to talk about that, so glad that you did. But what made you go to film school, man? Because, you you know, you, you went to UNC Wilmington and it wasn't feeling it. What made you go to L.A.? Because, you know, that's the place that everybody uh -huh. tell you, hey, don't go. You ain't going to make it. You ain't going to survive. You know, you're going to so be I, a artist. I had all those. I had all those naysayers. I had a lot of people telling me that. Um, it's funny because I actually had like some friends who were filmmakers who was like, don't go, like blah, blah, blah. And then now they hit me up like, hey, I got questions. <laughs> and it's like, I guess I got answers now. Like, I guess, you know, I'm that guy now. But um, you know what? This this part isn't exactly film related, but um, the, the final thing that pushed me to go to LA, and this is like my other advice I always give to people is like, when it comes to doing a change of career or just a change of paths anyway, you have to get rid of the dead weight in your life. Mm -hmm. And the dead weight can be family, it could be friends, it could be a job, it could be relationships, it could be anything. For right. me, my dead weight was the relationship I was in. Yeah. Because the girl I was dating, she had no aspirations of ever leaving North Carolina. We was going to go to Atlanta if we did leave, but then even when that came, we just didn't go. Right. So I went through a really bad breakup. And that breakup had to have happened because what that breakup did was I called my boy who lived in uh, Long Beach and I was like, yo, I'm coming. And it was like, you know, I've been hearing this for years. I'm like, nah, we broke up. Fuck her. I'm coming to LA. Right. And it was, it was three months. That's how it happened. We broke up in May. I was in LA in August. That's not three months. That's four months. Four months. Yeah. Damn. Um, yeah. That's how, that's how fast it happened. And it was like, boom, I'm gonna save up this money. It was like, I'm just couch surf, so I'm not paying no rent. And I was like, I'm going. And then like the time kept coming, I was like, I'm going. He was like, you sure? I was like, I'm still going. He was like, all right, I believe you when you get here. Right. And like, you know, because I mean, cause it was just one of those things, like people kept telling me, like I had like friends who weren't like necessarily like in film related stuff. We just kept saying like, oh, you should move to LA. Oh, if you ever come, you can stay with me. And then it was like, you know what? Finally take up that offer. So from 2012 to 2017, I kept being told, like, move to L.A., move to L.A., move to L.A. All right. Um, even at UNC Wilmington, like, I met this lady who uh, I think she's, like, the vice president of Screen Gym Studios down there. When I told her what I wanted to do, she was like, oh, don't go to Atlanta. You need to go to L.A. She's like, you're going to be a writer. She's like, all this stuff, everything is starts off in development in L.A. Right. Then it goes all over the place. So she was like, you need to go to L.A., develop stuff, and then you just convince them to shoot it in Wilmington. Then they'll bring it here. And then that's when it like the show starts production and stuff. But she's like, everything starts in LA. Mm. Like that's just where everything just the branch out of it grows. So and I don't get me wrong, like my ex was like always too, like, you need to go to LA, but I don't want to go to LA. <laughs> but you so then, 
Yeah, so then I was going to say, so we had like a really bad breakup. I abruptly decided to move to LA and then I got to LA and it was just like, now what? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it, it was like, you know, it's been like this big spectacle. It's like, now I'm here. It's like, now what? <laughs> um, at the time, I thought acting classes were a scam. Okay. Um, so I was like anti-acting class. Um, I was like, you know, just get a real blah, blah, blah. And that quickly changed because I met people who was like, acting classes aren't a scam. Like, it's just that since I'm coming from North Carolina, I'm so used to like people doing things in scammy like ways. Because I actually had met a guy who um, was going to give me experience on set, but wasn't going to pay me because I had to prove that I knew how to PA, which was just pretty much plugging in lights and carrying stuff. I had to do that for two shoots. And then like the day rate was like 250. And I was like, was it back pay or anything? He was like, no. Nah. I was like, this really sounds like you could use me for free for two shoots and then decide like, oh, I don't have the, I can't meet your standards. And I, I just committed to two 12 hour days for you. All right. Nothing for experience, like, no. <laughs> and then like, you know, I would meet people who would be like, oh, I teach acting and it's just like, okay. Like, what's your qualifications? I'm an actor. And it was like, okay, yes. you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so when I got to LA, it was like, oh, acting classes? Like, nah. And then, you know, I just met people, talked to them, I audited a few classes, and then like, I decided on one, it was called LA Acting Studios. Mm -hmm. And they would like, they, that was like my second family. Like they just like embraced me fully. And then like, since they also knew I kind of had this like want to direct and stuff, that was like really cool. And then I got accepted into film school while I was there. And at the time I couldn't afford film school. Right. Um, like I said, I owed out of pocket. I think it was like 2,500 out of pocket that I still had to owe by having to pay LA rent and stuff. And so my acting coach and he was like, I'm gonna help you out. And I was like, oh, he was like, you're done with acting class for now. Stay in touch but you're done with acting class because not everyone gets accepted to film school mm. and you're at a top 25 film school. He's like, you're going to film school. So don't worry about paying for acting class. That's over for you for now. He was like, stay in touch. We stay cool. And if you like, if I can, I'll produce your first movie for you outside of film school. You just got to become, you know, you got to do what you have to do. Stay in touch, man, him super cool. Um, He's actually from North Carolina. So every time I'm in North Carolina, he's like, did you go to Bojangles? It's funny because he's a white dude. So it's like, every time I'm like posted, I'm in North Carolina. It's a, you got that Bojangles? It's just like, oh man, I know like how it looks to everybody else. Like why does white dude always ask for about fried chicken? But it's because he's from North Carolina and there's no Bojangles in California. Right, right. So, yeah, so me and him, we still super cool. Um, I'm actually going to start up acting classes again in February, 2020. Um, and yeah, that, that's kind of like how that journey happened. And then once I got to film school, it was like, make the most of the, oh, before I got to film school, this is like a really, really important part of my journey mm -hmm. that I have to share because, you know, not everyone was there. So through that acting studio, they did like this LA film con where they invited all these industry professional people to come. There was a panel of five judges, five directors. Four of them went to film school. They all said, don't go to film school, the four directors. Then the fifth director was like, oh, that's crazy. He was like, because I wish I went to film school. And they all just looked at him. He was like, what they did in two to four years at film school, I did 10 years on my own. Mm -hmm. So he was like, what they learned in two years, I had to learn in 10. He was like, because in film school, you, you constantly shooting, making projects, failing, learning, failing, learning, failing, learning. Okay, now you're starting to get some progress. Right. He's like, when you don't have that, it's... You got to invest all this time and money. You got to get all this equipment, get people together. You shoot, you fail. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, do we really want to work with this guy again? Right. I ain't got convinced people like, oh, no, 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 blah, blah, blah. So like, instead of you shooting like 10 different things in a year, you shoot one thing every other year. And then like, it's, it's just like your progress of getting better, slower and slower. And then like the people that was the directors when the film, so they was like, oh, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> And that was the conversation that made me say, you know what? I'm gonna go to film school. Dang. And that's what I did. I went to film school. I shot like, not full beginning, middle and end, but I believe I got probably about 10 to 12 projects that I've done. I got a homeboy who 
he still has two more years left and he's already shot 17 projects because he just started, he just took extra classes. So he's just always shooting right. because you learn from your productions. Right. And that's the big thing, the biggest takeaway I got from film school that I wish I would have known to apply to my projects before film school. But it's like, you you have to, that's what I said earlier, you have to learn from every project that you do. And if you don't learn something from it, somehow you failed within that project. Right. Which means like, if you didn't learn anything from it, I, the way I see it is, you didn't push yourself hard enough. Like that project could have been better. Right. You didn't learn anything. So it's like, you just played it safe. Mm. And it's going to, and I feel like that's going to show. It's going to show that you played it safe. Right, right, right. So, so it's like, push yourself. Mm-hmm. So tell me this, you know, you're, you graduated, got your MFA. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, you make it, you're a filmmaker now. So take us to like your creative process when you're creating a film. And like everyone has a different thing. Like I see the vision first and then the script or they do the script first and then the actors and I, like, what's your process when you create a film? So my process, everything for me normally starts off as a scene. Like it's never the beginning. It's never, sometimes it's the end. Sometimes it's in the middle. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it could even be an opening. Like I, I just said, it's never the beginning. Sometimes it could be the beginning. It's very rare that I ever like see a beginning first. Right. But it's like, I see the scene first. I see what happens. And then I create a story based off of that. Okay. So um, one of the feature films that I'm developing right now is um, about two sisters who have to fight for the death to claim the throne. And I actually came up with that idea from, I saw a clip, you know, I think it was like one of the old Star Wars trailers, but I didn't know it was like a Star Wars video game trailer, Nice to the Old Republic. Like it took me like three years to find it. But I seen this clip like probably like four or five years ago. And I thought it was like so cool. It was these two brothers who was training and you see them train from like being a child to being an adult. And then one of the brothers kills the other at his father's footsteps, like at his father's feet. Because the brother like turned to the dark side and tried to kill the dad and the other brother like tried to save the dad and wound up killing the other brother in the process because of how brutal the training was. But I didn't want to do it based off brutality. I wanted to do it based off of compassion. So what if you put two people in this situation to fight, but they don't want to fight each other? How does that fight look? And then that started off with that idea. And then it became, you know what? I want to do this fantasy thing. Let me throw some magic in there. And then it was like, and I want them both to have magic. What if I make one, like the physical war, like art, like, RPG style. One is a warrior class. The other is the sorcerer class. All right. One is way stronger physically than the other. So all of the physical traits are way better than the other. Mm-hmm. The other one is just got, it's like a magical prodigy. So now you got these two different sides fighting each other. And yeah. And then it's like, you know, and I still kept the same, you know, fight at the parents' feet kind of thing. And it's just the parents watching. And so, and so then like, so just, so that's what I say. So it just started off as that. And you don't know what the story is going with. You just know it's just two people fighting each other right now. So I just, then I developed a whole story based off of it. And it's funny because um, I originally created it as a short and then my teacher loved it. It was like, I think you should make this a feature. And the teacher who said that he actually like has, his production company has Oscars. So, oh, okay. <laughs> and, he was like, and, he was, and he told me, he was like, you know what? Um, turn this into a feature. And when you finish it, I want to read it. He's like, even if you finish it after school, like I want to read it, which is why I need to get that done by March. <laughs> I want to be like five years out of, hey, how you doing? Remember that, that script I was writing about? Like, no, nah, I want to go ahead. <laughs> so, so since I started as a short, I already got the ending. But since I expanded into a feature, there's more elements that I had to put into it. Right, right. So now I'm just so now I'm truly at a part in the script where I don't know what's happening. Right. So I got to go and re-outline it because, like you know, things things change as you start writing. So it's like even though I have like that scene that I want to get to, it's like the way that I originally got there was one way. Then it was like, oh, okay, we're gonna make this a feature, so we need to put an hour worth of footage before we get there. Mm. So then it's like, what's happening in an hour? 
And then yeah. it's like, you have an original outline. And once you start writing and dialogues, I was getting certain things. It's like, ooh, wouldn't it be nice if like this character, blah, blah, blah. So you kind of got to go back into your outline, change right. it up a bit, and then make sure, you know, everything's still flowing and factual. And then, so now I'm just at a part where it's like, okay, they're here, but what happens while they're here to get from point A, well, to get from like point C to point D. All right. That's why I'm now in the script. So I'm about 35 pages in, but it's like I'm at this entire new sequence that I kind of just don't know. Right, right, <laughs> right. Like I know how the sequence has to end, but it's like I gotta get there. Everything so that's what I'm like re-outlining right now. And then um I have another feature film that I'm developing that started off with an idea of I wanted to do a western, because I just got into westerns. Um I want to do a western, but with a black lead. Interesting. Interesting. And I wanted it to be to a point where it's post-Civil War and the whole like, you know, racial tension of slaves just being freed is kind of like, it's not the overcast of the movie, mm -hmm. but it's like these characters, these white characters that he interact with. Right. It's their mind. So you got this black cowboy and it's like, oh, yeah, see, it's all Lincoln's fault. Free to, like, free to slaves and now these people just walking around with, with pistols, thinking right. they want of us, taking my go, you know, things like that. <laughs> So it's like, you know, like that would be kind of like just a theme of like, oh, okay, this is post-Civil War. <laughs> like, it's not, because I always hate when I see like period pieces and it's just like, you see a black dude walk in and everyone's like, oh, hey, we'll bring you into town, whiskey. <laughs> First round's on me, yeah. <laughs> like, no, it's like, you know, it's still America. <laughs> uh, so that's like the other feature that I'm working on right now. And then I got like some other projects that I'm doing. Cause um, yeah. So yeah, so, that, that's, so that's like, that's my process. It only starts off as like either a scene mm -hmm. or a character and a mood. Okay. And then like I create everything around it. But it's very rarely ever a story first. That's dope. That's interesting which, from a which is, filmmaker's perspective. Because you know, I'm coming from an artist's perspective. Like we see the whole story for you to have that creative process. But it yeah. seems like creating, being a filmmaker can be very challenging. Right. What are, what yeah. are some of the hard part, the harder parts about just being a filmmaker? Because it seems like it's uh -huh. very intricate. The number one hardest part about being a filmmaker is money. Mm. Like everything costs money. Right. And like from an actor's perspective, you know, for you it is like SAG minimum 125 a day. Right. So it's like for you, you're like, oh, it's only three days I'm working. That's three, uh, 375. Mm hmm. Yeah, 375, 325. My math is, is really bad right now. <laughs> you was right, 375. Yeah, 375. Yeah, because I actually had it in a budget the other day. So yeah, so 375. And then you like, I don't understand why like, why they can't pay me that. It's only 375. But then it's like, how many principal characters do I have that I got to pay that 125 a day to? Right. Like, <laughs> okay, like, he 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 got ten thousand dollars. Like, why is he stressing over paying me my three seventy five? Because like, yeah, we got five principal characters who are here for three days each. So that's three seventy five times that five. Right, right. Then y'all gotta eat, right? <laughs> gotta have food. Oh, not only do you have to have food, you're also in some kind of wardrobe. Guess what? We gotta shoot with something, <laughs> and it's and it's just like you know costs and stuff add up to the point where it's like unless you're the person covering you know doing the budget for the entire thing you don't realize how expensive it can be so on um, the and it's something that my chair kind of told me he was like anyone can throw money at a problem mm -hmm. so you need to develop problem solving skills that don't involve money so when you have a problem how can you fix it without money yeah. and that's kind of what i've gone through so like this project on paper, the budget was um, the one, like I said, the superhero film my shot is called Dream. The budget on paper that I had to turn into SAG, because this is my first union project, was I believe about 3500 mm -hmm. And that was just with the actor's pay. Right. In actuality, it cost me probably about $600. Mm -hmm. And that's also because I got kind of just got really good with like recycling, wardrobe and stuff. So like, um, 
you just go to like places like big corporations who got like a really good return policy and you make sure that you're not spilling fake blood and things like that on stuff. So it's like, if there is a scene that's bloody, take your character shirt off. Right. Just have it where it's like, you know, we captured you, we stripped your shirt off. Right, right, right. And then, you know, some people might be like, oh, that's like fan service. Like, why is he topless? Because we have to return his outfit. <laughs> we don't need to get it. And, you know, it's just one of those things, like, it has to, but it has to make sense within the story. Right. So, like, okay, we can take off his regular shirt and we just buy like a $5 pack of t shirts mm-hmm. from like a gas station or something. So yes. that way we can get that bloody. Right, right, right. The problem with that is, is the shirt pre bloody or is the blood dripping out their mouth? <clears throat> so, because if the blood is dripping out their mouth, guess what? Continuity wise, what happens when you have to go back and do another tape? You can't use that same bloody shirt because how's the shirt already bloody if the blood just starts dripping out their mouth? Right, right. So then, so then you have to like plan things of like, okay, if we're going to have blood dripping out of his mouth. What if we just do an extreme close up on that? Right, right, right. You, you never see the shirt. You just see blood dripping out of his mouth. Mm, I like So then now those stains, you know, so that's what I say, like, it, it, that's what I mean by like problem solving. And it's like something simple, but it's just like, yeah, and like you can even do the same thing with a chick. It's like, oh, why do they have this chick and nothing but a bra? Well, this bra was like $10 at Walmart. <laughs> so, this is, so this is ten dollars that we are okay with just throwing away right versus like oh she had on like a blazer and something else they cost like 200 we need to return that but we can't get something else to match this that's like cheap that we could throw away so we just want to have to put her in a new bra mm. and then it, you know and then it just becomes a thing like what i say like it's like fan service mm-hmm. so then it's like you know so then you gotta you borderline between that like oh they just wanted to have a woman and they're like just a bra. But then it's like, you know, that's criticism that you're just gonna get. But it's like, am I doing this because I wanna have a woman in a bra to have her titties out? Or am I doing this because she's gonna be bleeding and getting cut up and shit and we just don't have any wardrobe that we can cut up. All right. So that's what I mean by it's like, you know, you and then uh, you it's also good to have um I guess like a line producer, I believe that's the person that would like kind of oversee like how money is being spent. But a lot of it comes down to the director and the different heads of departments. So right. that's something like the director and wardrobe would talk about. If you have enough money to actually have someone to oversee wardrobe. Right, right, right. Because I mean, it takes like some weight off your shoulders as a director producer. Like if you have a specific person for each specific thing, like you got wardrobe and then it's like wardrobe is kind of over like hair and makeup and wardrobes. And then like you also got someone who's on makeup. So they're all talking to the wardrobe person right. and then only the wardrobe person's coming back and talking to you versus right. everyone coming back and talk to you. Yeah, it's, it sounds like like when you, uh when people, I think with people, they flipping houses and they have a budget and it's like, yeah, I want to have this granted, but is it, do I really need it? Is it going to really yeah. make my house that much? Yeah, so it becomes like a want versus a need. Like, right. what do you want? Versus what do you need? Yeah, but can I really afford, like, is it necessary that much if it's something I'm going to flip anyway? Like, is it really makes sense? Another me? another one. So like, um, I so I had this project rise. That's the one that my editor just gave me the final cut of today. So we um, what we do? We uh, in it. I originally had it where because I'm acting in it, and I had a guy supposed to come with a blunt object that he kind of like. I want to do this like whole like horror movie scene where he's like dragging it on the ground, and he got the close up of it just being pulled along the ground, and then he walks into the room, and then my character's like, "Oh, I wasn't expecting," and then he just like smacks me in the face with it. Right. But it's gonna be a good like six feet between us, and this is gonna be like a time acting thing, like where when he swings it, I turn my head. Right, right. But this was my first time doing this level of production in school. So they was like, this is a stunt. You need a stunt coordinator. So I was like, I can't afford a stunt coordinator. So I went back in and literally changed all the things that were potential stunts. Like I had people running, they're no longer running. The scene just starts with them already there. (laughs) I had another one where like this, like, the guy like he pulls over to the side of the road and it's like a creepy dude that like grabs him and like that was considered a stunt because it's like you know he's grabbing him he's lifting him off his feet he's applying pressure because people can get hurt it's an insurance thing so i changed it to like the little little african dart thing so i'm just a sound effect and then 
then it was like, well, how, like, you know, you blow in the dark. I was like, nope, what we're going to do is the camera cuts away, it cuts back, and you just see him Pour it take this. And I used uh, martini toothpicks because I was working at a restaurant. So I just took like a handful of martini toothpicks. Right. And so they're like little, like, damn it, like crystallized, like little prisms right. that we just stick olives on. And then, like, so he takes it, looks at it. And then the camera just dissolves. <laughs> and yeah. so in this new scene where it's like, he's supposed to like hit me with the blunt object. He walks in with this martini toothpick and then throws it at me. Um, the way I had him throw it was you I take a shot where he takes out of his pocket and you see him like cock his arm back. And then when he brings his arm forward and this was like, and this is the theater background right. that I kind of got from it. Cause you know, you have to stage fight scenes on the stage, but it's like, you you can't you know it's not so much that you can do right right I got the toothpick in my hand so when he brings his arm down I bring my hand up so it looks like he throws a toothpick and it lands in my neck but what it is it's in my hand the whole time and I just bring it up as his hand comes down it's just timed perfectly and then I just like step out of the frame and then you just got a sound effect it just makes it sound like I fall and I tell everyone look down right so it's like when I step back both of y'all look down. Because mm. all the screen is is lying. Right. <laughs> right. So I like step, like I kind of like squat down when I step out, and it's just they just both look down at the ground. Mm. I'm standing off to the side. It looks like I've been taken out now. So instead of me having this bat, like the blunt object smacking me across the face, right, right. and then he was like standing over top of me, just beating me. Right. And the way I like filmed that was like you just see the girls smiling in the background. Right, right. I cut all of it out and did that and kind of found out I could have kept it all in. I just had to explain <laughs> how I was going to do it safely. So that was like the funniest part of school. Because right. uh, that runs our production office. He was just like, Kendrick, I spent a whole day going through your script, lining up all the stunts, and you removed them all. I was like, yeah, because you said like it was, I wasn't about to be able to shoot. I was supposed to be shooting in four days. So I just removed it. <laughs> he was like, you didn't have to. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I thought that's what she was telling me. It was like, it was so funny. <laughs> like I said, it was my first time doing like production paperwork for it. But but yeah, but that's like I say, like that's an example of like, you know, having to come up with creative ways to do things that is like, you know, the story needs to progress. Right, right, but right. It's like, you know, it doesn't, It you might think it has to progress that way, but it doesn't have to progress that way. Right. Like things can change. So it's like, if you can't do things safely, well, if you can't do things and you can't afford to do it, switch it up. I don't yeah. yeah. And also, like, you know, know what you want to pour your money into. So it's like, if you do have money and it's like, okay, this is an action movie and I just need, we need an action sequence. Yeah. So it's like, instead of you pouring all your money into like wardrobe, pour your money into that action sequence. Yeah. And then it's like wardrobe just becomes like a little bit lax. It's like, oh, everyone's wearing army fatigues and white tank tops. Cool, because <laughs> guess what? You got, this, you got this phenomenal ass action sequence right. that's like you know, your bread and butter. Right, they're right. soldiers. Soldiers look alike. You know, make it make it a reason why they're all wearing like army fatigues with you know white tank tops. Perfect example. Like, look at Reservoir Dogs. They all wear black suits, white shirts. Right. Same joint. Super, simple. Super <laughs> simple. And then the whole story takes place in a warehouse. Right. So, I mean, it seems like you've done, you know, quite a few projects, you know, you, you got your, MFA, you, you've been doing, you know, some, a lot of things, a lot of great things. I've been following you, seeing your work. Have you had a moment yet where you, cause I know artists were super critical of ourselves, mainly we're our biggest critic. Have you had a moment yet where you felt like, okay, I'm successful in this. I, I'm, I'm successful because everyone has a job. Like you always like, what's the next thing I can do? Have you had a moment yet where you felt like, uh, I'm becoming successful in this? Not at all. Nice. Um, even when people like reach out to me, ask me for help or like asking me for questions and stuff. And like, you know, like I feel like people have put me on a pedestal much higher than I actually am. And it's just one of those like, and I hate it because then it makes me even more critical of myself. Cause it's like, what am I doing that's making them thinking that I'm good? <laughs> Cause it's like, I'm lying to people. And why am I lying to people like this? So it becomes, that's what I'm saying, it was because like, so it's like when people ask me for help, it's like I become even more critical of myself, mm. which just actually helps me raise the bar for what I need to do. Because wow. it's like people see my projects and it's like, oh, 
they think this is good. This is terrible. Okay, I need to do better because people are looking and like they're seeing this and they think that this is good and this isn't good. So I gotta do like the next one has to be even better. Mm-hmm. So that's like that's the way my thought process is with it. Um, it's funny. I got another example. So like. A lot of people see the stuff that I shot in school and they would think that I was spending thousands of dollars on it. Right. I would be like, nah, I was like, I never go past a month worth of rent. <laughs> Cause like I, I use my refund check to kind of like fund my project. So it's like, so if I can't shoot it for uh, less than 800, it ain't gonna happen. Gotta go back to the drawing board. Right, right. Kind of thing. And, and I, you know, and I kind of like will put my money into food because I'd be like, look, thanks for helping me. Make sure everyone eats good. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but it was just like, for the most part, it was just, um, so yeah, like someone asked me to help them produce a project. And I was like, you know, I've never produced something outside of my own. Mm-hmm. And her budget was like 10,000. And so, you know, and I, you know, did a paperwork for her and I was like, yeah, like you said like your budget's 10K from everything that you've told me so far, you're at $13,500. Mm-hmm. So you're $3,500 over budget. Over, oh, right. So I was like, this is what areas you can save money with the budget. Like, you know, you got an equipment fee, get rid of that. We are in film school, use the equipment that we have in the equipment center. Right, right. And I was like, if you don't have it, they can't use it. Point blank period. Like, that's just, you got to put your foot down. Like, because a lot of people would like go and rent outside stuff. Right. You got the money to do it. By yeah. all means, you can do it. But like I said, like, like I said, it's like the chairman of the department said, it's easy to throw money at a problem. Fix it's it. harder to fix it without that because, you know, once you leave out of school, a lot of times it's, you can't be like, oh, we went over budget. The studio going to be like, the fuck you mean you went over budget? Yeah, you got to check. <laughs> like, yeah we, we need three million more. <laughs> Unless you like Ridley Scott, right. Tom Cruise, like you some big name. <laughs> like, ain't nobody about to give you extra money. <laughs> right, right, right. I started now, like, yeah, okay, this we just won't have to write this off as a loss. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about how crazy, man. Uh, you talked briefly earlier about 2020 and the year it was and how crazy it was. But let me ask you this: do you feel like the 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 whole pandemic and just 2020 as a whole, do you feel like as an artist it helped you? Because a lot of people got a, a time to kind of really zone in and focus, have some self-reflection, and others feel like Man, it just messed up everything I had lined up. How do you feel like as that as an artist that affected you? So I want to. This is this is a great question. So I really want to pose. This is what was supposed to happen for me in twenty twenty. Um, I was supposed to start an internship at that production company where my teacher has has Oscars. Mm-hmm. I was supposed to. I had just got um, named a student ambassador to the Producers Guild of America. Um, supposed to graduate in the fall. I was supposed to have had all my projects. I was supposed to have my first project, uh, Rise, completed by the spring. Mm-hmm. And I was supposed to have my second project completed at least by August. Right. And then I was supposed to shoot my final thesis film in the fall. Those were my plans going into it. The student ambassadorship, that kind of popped up. The internship, that kind of popped up. None of that happened. Except me graduating in, in December. I did graduate. That happened. So what did happen was I made myself financially clear leaving out of school. So like my car's paid off. I have enough money saved up for rent in LA that I'm good for, I'm good for a while. (laughs) Then um, uh, student ambassador, nothing really came from that, but I was on a Zoom call with Spike Lee when he was talking about um, the... um, Man, I'm so mad I just drew a lapse. The the movie he did with Chadwick Boseman on Netflix set in uh, after the Vietnam War where they went back to Vietnam. The Five Bloods. The Five Bloods. The Bloods. Was it The Bloods? The Five Bloods? Five Bloods is the name yeah. of it. Yeah, so it was like he did like a little conference call. Like it wasn't like personal one-on-one, but it was just nice hearing him speak about, you know, the movie and that Spike Lee is still an independent filmmaker. He's All not right. a Hollywood filmmaker. Um then I had more time to actually sit and think about my projects versus rushing to get them done, mm. which to me has made the projects even better. Yeah. Um, my final film that I was going to shoot, since I didn't shoot it, I've been told like the story is really good. 
I'm able to still come back and shoot after I graduated because the school has given us that opportunity. So um, I have more time to actually try to raise money for this one, mm-hmm. attach some actual talent to it, like some uh, B to C list actresses and stuff, like people that's on TV shows now and supporting roles. Right. I've you know, learned how to like actually properly contact their managers and like how to sell the project a little bit. Um, because my teacher for that one, he was like, he felt like this could make a lot of festival noise because it was different and it was dark. Right. It was like a commentary on like social injustice. Um, and now I'm in a, I, I'm, I'm in a, like a really good spot to have my feature films, at least the first draft done by March because I don't have to worry about working. Mm. Because so while I'm still looking for work in my actual career, I don't have to get like a nine to five to just pay the bills because financially I'm able to like have some leeway before I'm forced to work again. So it's like, you, you know how it is. Like when you graduate, you know, you don't have a rich mom and dad and you just go kick it at their house. You, right. you know, bills don't stop. Right. They keep so it's like, while you're looking for work, yeah, like while you're looking for work, you're still having to like work your crappy job that you can't put in all the focus and stuff that you need to put into all right. your um, your goals and stuff. But, you know, if the pandemic didn't happen, I don't believe that I would be in this position. Mm. So I'm, I, you know, I'm just looking at the positive. So like, sure, I missed out on an internship. Um, I missed out on like other events by being a part of the Producers Guild, but I've gained all this other stuff as well. Right, right. That's so it's like, you know, just gives you time to focus on the art and take what I've learned and like implement it properly. Right. So you talked about some of the films that you're working on, some projects you're working on. Uh, what can we look forward to seeing from you or just what you got in the works of, you know, things I know as an artist, you always got something going on. So what can we look forward to yeah. seeing you coming up? Well, um, I got a short called uh, Rise. It's a paranoid thriller. Um, a failed politician reaches out to his ex-girlfriend for political help. Um, but then he learns that she's a member of a cult. So he goes to the cult to try to free her and learns more about himself. Okay. And then I have another project called Dream. Um, that's about a lonely college kid um, realizes he's not the only person with powers. He meets a girl, but a villain puts the world to sleep. So in order for him to continue his relationship with his girl, right. he has to find his inner confidence to defeat the villain and wake up the world. And then the uh, the next short that I would be doing, the one that's like trying to get some festival noise, that one's about um, a very educated, witty black girl is tired of unarmed black man being shot by police and decides to take matters into her own hands and get her own hands dirty to get her own sense of justice. Ooh, interesting, interesting. I like it. Yeah, and that would be like, yeah, that's what I say. So like those would be the, um, so that last one, the script is done, the pitch deck is done. I just gotta like start like doing like some fundraising. I'm gonna try to shoot like a little trailer to attach to my fundraising link. And um, try to get like five thousand dollars to shoot it, that's which tough. is extremely low. But it's funny because like you hear these numbers and it's like, oh, that's low. Like, <laughs> so, like yeah, like five thousand. Um, because when I did a budget, like I mean, of course, like if I could get like ten to fifteen thousand, I could definitely do it up. But I was like, with the budget I did, I was hovering around like thirty-five to forty-five hundred. So I was like, I could just do it at five thousand and redo the budget with that in mind. Yeah. And, yeah. See what happens. That's dope, man. So before I let you go, man, I got to give you an opportunity to talk to the people straight up, man. Um, what is it that you want people to know about Kendrick, the filmmaker? And even what is, or even what is something you just want to leave the people? Because there may be artists, there may be filmmakers that's looking, you know, for answers or, or just even advice or even just trying to how to get into the industry. Is there anything that you can leave them with or, you know, anything you want to say? Um, I want to say, there's something my dad used to say. At the end of the day, when you die, you're in that casket alone. Yeah. So it's, it's your life to live. It's your art to create. Don't let other people tell you what you can and cannot do. If it's something you cannot do, 
it's up to you to figure out how to do it. And if you can't figure out how to do it now, that doesn't mean it's not possible. Mm. At one point, sending a rocket to the moon was far-fetched. Now we got thousands of satellites floating around the earth. Anything is possible. And in this filmmaking world, you can put whatever you want on that screen. You just gotta have an audience. Yeah. Yes, definitely. So man, first of all, my brother, before I even you know say anything, thank you first for, for sharing this stage with me, man, for just speaking your truths, talking to the people, man. I, I know, my easiest way to say, it, I know dope people who do dope things and what better <laughs> to shout out them and to give them an opportunity to really talk about it. Uh, for me, coming from, you know, I, I got an actor background, I'm an actor, to see somebody that I know do filmmaking. Like you said, it seems so far-fetched for me to think, oh, filmmaking, oh, I don't know nobody who does a film, like how is this? But to see somebody you know, to me, it, it it's a whole nother level, like, okay, so we can do this, okay. And I like the fact that you don't make the traditional Black struggle, everybody gotta overcome. We shall overcome type joint. Like I like that you're going completely different. So something else that I wanna say, and this is something that's like super, super important. Right. Um, this is just a strong belief of mine. I haven't been able to prove it yet, but I'm going to only work on projects that you believe in. If you don't believe in that project, don't do it just for the sake of saying you have a project. So it's like, like you said, like I'm not doing like the whole traditional black struggle films. When I first made it known to people that I wanted to be a director, so many people came to me like, oh, I got this hood story. Oh, I got this coming of age story about blah, blah, blah. And it was like, I knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. Now it's like, you like, don't get me wrong. Like you can do those things, find some kind of success and like, you know, make money to pay your bills. But at the end of the day, it's like, that's not what you want to do. Right. And you're only as good as your, you're only as good as your next project, but you're also only as good as your portfolio. And if your portfolio is nothing but like romantic comedies, but you want to do action movies, that's going to be a hard transition. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's possible. Like anything is possible. Because you do got some directors out there who like do all kinds of crazy stuff, but it's a harder transition. Yeah. They're going to look at it and I'm like, oh, you want to do action movies? You might be able to do like action, action. Com I, you might be able to do romantic comedies, action comedies, the action. Mm -hmm. like you can make that transition but then it's like now you gotta do those action comedies and it's like did you even want to do action comedies at all <laughs> like so yeah that's what i say so it's like i got i got a lot of those like dramas hood pieces right. do some drugs and how hard it is to be black and yeah. i was just like that's not the story i want to tell and that's what so it's like don't be afraid to say no like learn how to say no right and i've told a lot of people no yeah. And of course, you now people get upset with me. Oh, you, oh, you think you too good, blah, blah, blah. And at some point, yeah, I'm too good for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what I'm saying. Like, like, you know, have confidence in yourself, have confidence in what you can do. Like, because yeah. cause when I first, like, don't get me wrong. I got a lot of support now. But when people first knew that I want to do like these action and fantasy movies and stuff like that, it was like, with Black people? <laughs> good luck with that yeah okay and now it's like yo i've always believed in you man like you did it like you know <laughs> and it'd be like you know it's like don't hold on to grudges but remember remember who was there in the beginning and then remember who tried to jump on the ship all day it's easy to, it's easy to hop on when things is moving good <laughs> <laughs> but no man also real man i appreciate you being confident to say look this is what i want to do and standing on your own too to say, this is the type of films I want to make. Because so often, you know, in our art world, you easily somebody, you know what you should do? And the next yeah. thing you know, you switch that. You know what would be dope. And the next thing you know, you have no identity. You don't even know how you even got here. <laughs> you was like, I, I started off saying, I want to do drama. Now I'm doing suspense or I don't even, or uh, actually, I don't even know how I got here. But because- you know, the horror movies now, like how, how, to, how did I get here? <laughs> So you, it takes a strong person to to really believe in themselves when no one else does. And I think it was important for you to share that story that everybody wasn't like, can't you go make it? Let's go. Let's go to LA. What you need? It was like, all right, well, you know, like everyone else, because, you know, you hear the whole stories. I'm going to be a struggling. They're going to be a struggling actor like everyone else. And so for you to go somewhere 
and then be able to gain something. And not only that, like you got an MFA, dog. Like you're in the the eight percent of the world that has them. So shout out to you, my brother. I, I'm in that club too. But honestly, serious, man, it's great to see you know people doing things that's not the traditional things, you know. And I think that's the biggest thing because. Uh, like you said, there's a lot of black people in the anime. There's a lot of black people into other things, Star Wars and this and that. But you don't have to make a black version of that. Just do that. <laughs> like make your own fantasy world. And I think that's key. And for people out there, look at like let this be an example that you don't have to. Get- people will try to convince you to make the black version of it. They will try to convince. I had so many people try to convince me to make like, you know, I always call it like the nigga five version. Like people try to convince me to do like nigga five versions of like so much stuff. Like, oh, you in the Star Wars? And what we made like a black version of Star Wars. It's like, what, what is the black version? It's like, you know, ask, don't be afraid to ask questions. Like ask questions with qualifications. Like what's the black version of Star Wars? Man, you know, like, you know how like Dark Vader, Luke father, instead of Dark Vader chasing Luke, is Luke chasing Dark Vader. Cause it's like, you chasing your dad. Like, no, no. Like, no, not, not, no, you ain't mine. Like, no, nah. Luke, I'm not your father. I don't know what you're about. like. No, nah, I'm not not doing that. I'm not doing, I was like, you can find someone else who will probably like strike gold with that because it's not a bad idea. Right. It's just not what I want to do. And, and I think that's important. So man, I, I definitely, I know you don't look at, you know, that you're not doing it for the, trying to get the pat on the back to say you're successful, man. But as, as an artist talking to another artist, man, I salute you. I respect your work ethic. You're Thank very you. successful in my eyes just because you're doing it. You are giving people opportunity to see, like, you don't have to do the traditional route. Make your own path. And that was my whole goal with this show is, like, find your own way. Everybody ain't going to have the same path. We ain't got to follow the same blueprint. But if you go ahead and, and believe in yourself, you can find your way. So so definitely shout out to you, my brother. I thank you, I thank you, thank you for just believing in the vision, man, and taking part to be a part of the show, man. Thank y'all for tuning in. We will definitely catch y'all next week, but remember to always support the art. Catch y'all next week.